show of Five Shot Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Chris Smith. And wherever it is you get your pods, subscribe, share, and leave us a good rating. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. So welcome to another episode, and uh, we are joined again by the lovely Chris Smith. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Just uh, getting really cold in the British winter, but all, all good otherwise. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. As always, uh, yeah, the British winter, uh, I think I asked you early before the show started, uh, but what, five degrees over there? Of course, Celsius, but yeah, just uh, a few degrees to uh, to freezing. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, you said you could see your breath. Let's uh, <laughs> let's kind of see that yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, sat in your living room, you can see your breath. That's uh, it's quite old Britain. So, but yeah. we uh, keep calm and carry on, as the old saying goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, is there a uh, is there a go to tea for you to uh, kind of counteract this uh, this type of weather? Uh, PG tips, good old English breakfast breakfast tea. PG tips, about five a day. That normally keeps me quite warm. So. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm going uh, to need to get some tips offline from you uh, about uh, <laughs> the best type of tea and uh, how to do it. But because I just uh, low key, I I microwaved my tea this morning, but uh, all yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Is Always. it a blasphemous? Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah, you make it and then you microwave it. It keeps it hard for longer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. See, look. Yeah. The. Uh, you know, there might be an ocean between uh, between us, but uh, yeah, there's uh, definitely some uh, some likenesses to uh, the yeah. practices. But uh, <laughs> but let's get to uh, the episode, and yeah, so you know, the season is over. The MLS Cup has been won by NYCFC, and uh, yeah, before we get into that, let's uh, get into LA United news, and yeah. There was that expansion draft, and the expansion draft by Charlotte FC, they picked five players. Unfortunately, one of them was ours, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, once we saw that unprotected list, which uh, included Mo Adams, Ambrose, uh, Josh Bauer, uh, Jurgen Dom, DeJohn, Ronald Hernandez, Heinemann, Can, uh, Eric Lopez, Lungard, Mulraney, Sadich, uh, Kubo, and Anton Wax. I think we all had that feeling that Anton Wax was probably gone. But then, yeah, uh, this man right here, Chris Smith, uh, broke some news before the draft even happened. And uh, we had that looming feeling almost pretty much confirmed. Uh, talk us through, uh, yeah, you know, learning about Wax being uh, selected. Uh, in the expansion draft. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, I was definitely hoping I was wrong on that. I put a tweet out afterwards saying, I really hope the club changed their mind because obviously Anton's a really valuable player and a big leader in the group. But, but you're right, as soon as that list went up of, of players, I think he was he was definitely the standout in Atlanta. And I think Alec Can was another good name, possibly, but they'd already Charlotte had already signed a goalkeeper a couple of days previous, so... You know, centre backs of, of Anton Walks's quality are a dime a dozen in in MLS, and he was definitely going to go. Um, I became aware maybe a day or two before the draft that they had a list of about ten players um, that they were looking at, and they were obviously looking to narrow down to five. Um, other sources were were telling me that you know Anton was right high up on that list, and there was there was little chance of him dropping out, and then basically. A few hours before the draft, I just I got the word it's definitely happening. Feel free to sort of put it out there and, and generate a bit of interest. So, and um, and as we saw, it happened um, alongside I think a few other good moves. Um, I know Charlotte could end up becoming a bit of a rival with Atlanta United, but you know uh, you have to give them credit for that draft. I think they brought in a great centre back and a couple of other important sort of depth pieces, and then they've generated a lot of general allocation money that. They used our international roster slots that weekend, so yeah, um, and then obviously Alec can followed out the door as we thought he would afterwards, and um, he's obviously gone and got himself hopefully a starting spot at FC Cincinnati, so I think they were the two big names 
on Atlanta United's sort of unprotected list and it's not in the draft so both of them going they've, they've now both gone now so um so definitely work to do there for the front office mm -hmm. and uh i mean we'll get to i think the specifics of uh losing walks and can uh in a second but i think uh let's really chat about who you maybe would have kept instead uh you know and i mean left on the unprotected list uh instead of maybe anton walks and um you know maybe given an option and exercise that option on alec can i mean what what uh what would you have done i mean it was a real tough one with with anton because who do you replace him with because you're not obviously you're not you're not going to put sort of alan franco on there because big money was paid and um, same goes for the likes of Marcelino Moreno, Joseph, as he go back. To me, there's no no player there that I could see. It, maybe Brad Guzan, if if I'm being really harsh, mm -hmm. but I think losing both of the like either one of Anton Walks or Brad Guzan would leave a big leadership hole. Regardless, you know, mm -hmm. Brad Guzan's the club captain and by far the most experienced player at the club, mm -hmm. and Anton wore the captain's armband for four or five games last season, so big characters in the locker room but i think faced with that sort of flip of a coin unless i'm completely missing someone and feel free to correct to correct me i think facing that flip of a coin i think they made the right choice because guzan's the number one goalkeeper regardless of what you think of his quality i think he had a much improved season last season mm -hmm. and i think to lose that and what he brings to the locker room i think would have would have been a bit of a disaster if i'm quite honest um yeah, and for then, me, yeah. Well, uh -huh. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go, go. I was going to move on. You, yeah. Two or three. Yeah, for me, um, I mean, I would have dared Charlotte to pretty much take Brad Guzan uh, <laughs> at those wages, and especially they had taken or uh, signed a new goalkeeper. Um, I mean, basically, it's kind of, uh, you know, are they going to, you know, pony up those kind of wages uh, in their first year? And, you know, I think that's one of those things where you kind of roll the dice there. Uh, Anton Walks, um, yeah, I would have pretty much protected for sure because you know that you can get some uh, saleable asset for him. Uh, and I think Hosetu probably would have been that odd man out for me. Um, and for the reasons of this, it's like... Yeah, um, you know, while he's a, a smooth operator on the ball, uh, by way of assists and goals, it doesn't really maybe equate to the wages that he's on in MLS. And so it's also a daring uh, Charlotte FC to take him. And if he is, we, we've got other pieces that, um, you know, I think can, uh, I think, replace that kind of production especially with uh, maybe Emerson Hyman coming in or, you know, just bringing in another player. But Anton walks within MLS, he's proven himself. And, you know, you know that he probably, I mean, this is an estimate, but you probably could have gotten at least $200,000 in GAM. Instead, we only get 50. And so that's pretty much three times less than what we probably could have received yeah. in what's yeah, a Yeah, definitely. Um, I, think, I think you raise, you raise a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you, you you raise a good point with with Rosetta there. That's the name I knew I was missing a name somewhere, and that was the one. Um, in terms of the value that a player adds to to the roster, I think he was probably on the. Now that you bring him up on on the protected list, he was pretty much bottom, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Brad Guzan, again, maybe leaving him unprotected. The the one thing I do know about how Charlotte are operating in in building this roster is. The word value is getting tossed around a lot and you know they're not gonna overpay just for a name or to they're not gonna feel sort of really pressured to fill a position right away and, and then end up paying over the odds for it so i don't i think if they left brad guzan un, unprotected i don't think they'd have taken him personally and um, obviously they've already made moves for goalkeepers already um and again that word value i just don't i don't think they'd have seen the value in bringing him on board um, so maybe that would have been a smart move to, to put him on the unprotected list and, and keep hands on walks. But one of the little sort of thing to to note with this as well is maybe that this is unconfirmed. I'm trying to find out myself, but I, I haven't been able to sort of track down any sort of confirmation yet. But I would 
I would think that Miles Robinson's at least not going to go until the summer. Based on this, um, obviously Alan Franco's there. You would assume that George Campbell would now play a much bigger role, and he impressed quite a lot in in limited minutes this year. And when he came off the bench, for example, he, you know he helped see out games and, and did a really good job. So mm-hmm. there are there are pieces there to sort of move around and and mm-hmm. offset this loss. But yeah, I think you raise a good point with Rosetta and maybe playing a game of chicken with with Brad Guzan might have paid off as well. Yeah, and uh, it's also that uh, Atlanta United, uh, according to Felipe Cardenas, uh, were uh, <clears throat> interested in Shane O'Neill from Seattle Sounders. Uh, he's a free agent, and so you know there is maybe uh, something in the cards for getting a veteran center back or a defender. But uh, I think at the end of the day, you know, is this with losing also Alec Can, and then of course Franco Escobar a couple days before that uh, in trading him to LAFC for two hundred fifty thousand dollars in guaranteed GAM, and then up to six hundred thousand dollars in GAM. Um, I mean, that's. I mean, we we got <laughs> up to six hundred thousand dollars in GAM for Franco Escobar, who didn't even play for us last season. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's one of those things where okay, yeah, that's probably a good move in terms of. Uh, you know, for the front office, but uh, is this a little bit of negligence? Uh, maybe you might not use those uh, maybe as harsh of a words, but Alec can pretty much go in for nothing uh, to FC Cincy when uh, we could have just exercised its option. I mean, uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on if this is something that, um, you know, could have been prevented? Um. I think, I mean, on the, on the Escobar deal, I mean, it's, it's always sad to see him go and, you know, he's played such a huge role in, in where this club is today. But as you mentioned, that's a lot of money. So a player who's out on loan last season and probably wasn't going to figure much this season, well, next season even. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think that's good business myself. Um, in terms of Alec Khan, I, I do personally think there's been quite a bit of overreaction to it. Um, a great number two, perhaps the best number two goalkeeper in MLS, sort of right up there, but a number two nonetheless. Um, if, if Brad Guzan stay in, how many games is Alec Khan going to play next season? Five, six, maybe. Um, in terms of being able to exercise the option, on paper, that sounds like a real easy thing to do. And, you know, maybe FC Cincinnati still would have come in and maybe paid a little bit of bit more cash for him had that been, that been done and he'd have still gone. And there you go, Atlanta United have got any got got the money. But when you think about how much gam you would actually get for a number two goalkeeper, um, versus the human situation that Alec is in, you know, he's mm. he's been at the club since the start and not not played anywhere near enough games to, to fit his talent. And um, a club's coming along and, and offering him a much better chance. Yeah. Uh, you know, Carl Spockenegger has known Alec Can for for a long time now. Um, is he going to deny him that chance to go and? Going, he's 31 now. He's you know his, his years are limited. Is he going to deny him that chance to go and play some games and enjoy himself in MLS? So, I think there's a human aspect there that people might be missing. Where, for the sake of what, say, fifty thousand in gam, just just let the guy go. And you know he's been a great servant to the club, and you reward that by letting him go and get a chance somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and no, I, I see your point for sure. Um, <clears throat> I think for me. There's just a lot of, I think, gam left on the table in which uh, if we're not getting rid of uh, the contracts of, say, like a Jurgen Dom uh, or, you know, other players that are on high wages um, that maybe aren't maybe performing to uh, their contract in that sense, uh, looking mm-hmm. at Hosatu, maybe Heinemann as well. Um, yeah, it gets to that kind of point where, yeah, we need everything we can get, and uh, you know, money on the table is, I think, uh, something that uh, this front office could do very well with if they had it. But now it's kind of left there, and so it is what it is. Uh, I think at this point, um, let's just hope that they can, I think, kind of mitigate these losses um, without you know having to. Uh, and, and this is the thing, yeah, Atlanta United. Uh, in terms of spending money, it won't really be an issue. Like, there's always going to be kind of um, you know money in the coffers, but the issue I think is we're still like playing around in the MLS structure, 
And so that MLS mm -hmm. structure is going to be very limiting. And, um, you know, so we'll still have to kind of play within those rules to be able to construct our roster. And so, you know, we'll see. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, to speak on your point about also um, kind of give some more props to Franco Escobar. I mean, definitely just a, a big, big piece that uh, I think would have maybe – uh, you know, played a big part um, into next season if we wanted him. If, uh, yeah, basically, because Hainse obviously didn't think that uh, he would have fit into a system. Uh, that was one of the things that was uh, said about him, uh, I think, uh, in Felipe Cardenas' piece, uh, that little exit interview, where basically Escobar, he talked about how he uh, went and left like many others on the team have left. Uh, where hmm. there wasn't a plethora of communication, uh, maybe uh, maybe some kind of mistruths being told to him before, uh, saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know, we're gonna keep you," and then a couple days later, "Hey, you know, sorry, we're gonna actually move you." It's uh, you know, it's definitely more of I think one of the things that uh, you know Carlos Bocanegra has been kind of um, lambasted for. Which, uh, on my end, I think it, uh, you know, there is fair criticism. But, um, but yeah. So, I, I think at, at the end of the day there, um, Escobar, like LGP, like Gressel, like uh, Donington Nagby, there's uh, some little bit of agitation kind of underneath that, um, you know, they weren't really told the truth, per se. But uh, you don't have to ne necessarily comment fully on it. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I can't say too much because obviously you have to protect your sources. So, But what I will say is even this latest round of departures, um, there has been another lack of communication um, where sort of players have been left in the cold and not knowing what's going on and sort of they find things out a bit later than you would like in, in a situation, you know, where your employer is trying to move you on and you have no idea about it until mm. until things are getting pretty close to being announced. So, yeah, without sort of putting my foot in it and saying too much, uh, the yeah. communication still isn't great from the front office to the players. Um, so it doesn't surprise me um, at all. You know, it's, as you say, it's, a, it's unfortunately a, a theme that has been occurring for a couple of years now and it's it's led to the loss of a couple of really foundational pieces of the club and mm -hmm. you know the word gets tossed around a lot but i think in in the context of such a young club pretty much legends you know that mm -hmm. they, they won the first ever titles with the club and mm -hmm. in the case of, of escobar you know he's, he's scored huge goals in, in that as well so um mm -hmm. yeah i mean with escobar i mean I, i've had conversations sort of with with coaches and and you know, staff at the club, and whereas Anton Walks was a bit of a road bump, where I don't think they ideally wanted to lose him, but they were kind of thinking it's MLS, this happens, we'll we'll recover from it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were as stressed about Franco Escobar going, uh, from, from what I can tell. Um, I'm sure, you know, he's he's versatile. He can play in a couple of different positions at the back, and you know, you love his commitment, you love his aggression, and he knows the club from back to front but mm -hmm. he also has a tendency to, to pick up a lot of rash yellow cards and mm -hmm. you know if he was loaned out last season and maybe you know Pineda didn't get a really good look at him and, and decided to maybe maybe bring in someone as we say like Shane O'Neill who he knows really well from his Seattle Sounders days and you got to trust Gonzalo with that you know him and Rob Valentino have, have done pretty well for the club so far so while the front office, I think, are still getting quite a lot of things wrong, I'm, I'm happy to trust the guys in the dugout right now to, to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, th that's the hope, is that they uh, can have a lot more influence on uh, that roster construction to get the guys that uh, maybe they want. And uh, because that's the thing. You know, I think the, the biggest gripe with a lot of people has been the loss of a lot of um, yeah, pieces that helped us win trophies. And uh, now we're not winning trophies and uh, not doing as well maybe in the league. So it's uh, definitely one of those things where I think it's not unfounded by a lot of the fans 
to uh, to have agitation and to be Boca out and all that uh, because there is that like what can he be given credit for and what you know can he you know yeah. not be you know be absolved of the, the blame for but um, but yeah moving on uh, we're gonna talk about how Bello and Lennon joined the U.S. men's national team camp for the friendly against Bosnia and uh, yeah Lennon with his first cap. And uh, Bello as well, uh, you know, being involved again. Miles Robinson given a break uh, because, yeah, he's been played a lot, uh, not only with LA United, but of course with the U.S. men's national team. Uh, but uh, Lennon, you know, getting his first cap. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, you know, is it uh, is it something that, uh, you know, you see he'll get a lot more of? Or maybe, uh, you know, it's maybe Burhalter trying some pieces out and seeing what he's got in the uh, in the old uh, depth department. Yeah, I think I think it's the latter personally. Um, I like Brooks Lennon a lot. Um, I think had Atlanta United picked up a couple more attacking pieces to go around Joseph Martinez last season, I think you'd have seen a lot more assists from him because his delivery is top class. Um, you know, he's a he's a great runner. Um, pretty strong defensively uh, for such an attacking fullback who used basically used to be a winger let's be honest yeah. um, so yeah I mean in the context of an experimental roster in a friendly that isn't really in a proper international window um, yeah great great for Brooks to get his call up and I think deserving in that context but I think there's that much depth at fullback now that it's going to take an absolute Herculean effort from from Brooks Lennon to push himself any further up the depth chart in my opinion and that's that's no detriment to him personally that just speaks volumes of the depth that the, the United States have got in that position at the moment in, in my opinion but yeah no definitely uh, definitely awesome to see that both of our fullbacks essentially were wingbacks uh, depending on uh, you know how we look at it uh, we're part of that uh, that starting 11 in the last 11 of the U, uh, the US men's national team uh, of 2021 so definitely uh, something to write home about and um, you know a uh, nice little kind of bookmark for this uh, 2021 season but uh, moving on from that yeah you know that uh, MLS Cup yeah basically uh, a little uh, little uh, down to the wire I would say at the very least uh, and then uh, you know goes down to penalties and uh, yeah do you think the deserving team won the MLS Cup this season oh that's a tough question isn't it because because the Reds have just tore everything up in the regular season so right. that, that's the trade-off between the playoff system where you get all the drama and, and then rewarding someone at the end of the season who's consistently been the best team so i think in the context of the playoffs i think nycfc probably deserved it in my opinion and um, i thought they played it perfectly against against that Lance united in the first round where they just let us dictate play and and just sort of knew that we weren't going to hurt them as much as we should have done and, and then kill us on a couple of set pieces where where they knew we, we were we had a bit of a weakness so and um, you know in terms of high-end quality who, who is better in in the in the whole of mls right now than, than nycfc you know tati castellanos is the golden boot winner mm -hmm. james sands in though who i don't think still doesn't get talked about enough i i don't think um considering he can play center back and hold him in field to basically the same really strong level maxi morales had a really resurgent resurgent season and um, Talis Magno looks like an incredible talent and he's he's still coming off the bench so and they did it all without Anton Tinnehome who's arguably the best right back in in the league right now and um, obviously picked up an ACL injury so to say that uh, did NYCSE outright deserve to win MLS Cup no because I don't think you can ever really say that one team above all absolutely deserves to win it, it you know you, you got the pitch and you, you beat what's in front of you but I think if you were going to pick someone in the playoffs I think you played some entertaining stuff and did the right things defensively why CFC really demonstrated that more than others yeah and shout out to the uh, our friends uh, the Cooligans for uh, yeah getting that chip as well uh, being part of that uh, the fandom there uh, yeah 
but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely <coughs> excuse me for me. Yeah, I mean it's uh it's a team that uh, if they win, make LA United look better in the sense that okay, we yeah mm. we lost to the eventual champions, okay, uh, but uh, yeah, really truly be told, I think it's that it's uh you know were they the uh, the sexiest uh, team throughout the playoffs? Uh, maybe not. But uh, hmm. I think they did everything that it took to win, and really a surprise for sure. Because definitely, uh, yeah, people have said the Revs. Uh, I mean, the Timbers were playing some really great stuff too, and yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of yeah. hard luck for those uh, those Timbers fans. Not only uh, you know losing one away, you know here, but then also losing one at home. Uh, yeah, at least they've got that one, so that's uh, you know they, they can still feel pretty okay. But uh, you know, my uh, my sympathy actually kind of goes out to them a little bit. Like that's uh, never fun to uh, to lose that many uh, kind of finals, uh, kind of in recent memory. But uh, but yeah, you know, it's uh, I think the question is, can NYCFC do it again? Can they do it next year? Can they win a supporter shield or, you know, win other trophies? Like, do you think uh, maybe they might be uh, broken up a little bit? Because, you know, there are some uh, some pieces that could be sold, too. Mm. No, I do, th- I do think they're going to get broken up. Um, I think it's going to be tough for them to, to repeat that. Um, Cut to cast the Arnos. Look. Looks like he's going to, to England. Um, who knows where James Tan could end up. This might be the the off season where he finally goes and um, Max Morales is going to be another year older and um, obviously they, they've got pieces to come in to, to replace that quality and you know just Thiago Andrade is there as I mentioned Tales Magno before but they've also asked um, Ishmael Tajiri Sharadi who I think is a really underrated player when, when there's a lot of rebuilding and reshaping to do I think the thing that's going to hold them back at least for support of Shield next season is we already know that they're going to be playing at three different home stadiums. Um, they're, they're going to be playing at Yankee Field, C- City Field. They're going to be back at Red Bull Arena again. It's that's tough to to keep moving around. And you know, again, I'll always point back to in some leagues, home advantage. I think is a trope. Um, but I think in MLS, I think it really counts because of the long travel distances. That if you've got your home crowd there and you're playing against a team that's just travel cross country and you know you got a, you're generating a really strong atmosphere that can be intimidating and it it can sap the life out of the opposition legs very quickly and um, and can and I see actually have that at, at two stadiums that they're not really used to playing at and one stadium that's your rival's home home ground mm-hmm. that's going to be tough and um, I don't see them falling apart by any stretch I think they're still going to be up there as one of the big contenders top two or three in the east maybe and, and another th- threat once again in the playoffs but I think with everything that's going to change and, and what they're still battling against in the city of New York, I think it's going to be tough for them to repeat this kind of success. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fully agree there. And it's also, yeah. Um, I it, One part of me is like, okay, this is uh, great for them, uh, but it's also not exactly the best optics for this league. Uh, you have a team that pretty much uh, doesn't have a home that uh you know wins the championship and so it's like oh cool like uh are they gonna do a parade no and uh <laughs> and so uh it's one of those like um you know uh yeah do they take it seriously it's just it's i wouldn't say a black mark but it, it'd be like it's kind of a little bit of a gray kind of like mm, that isn't the best look for this league um at the end of the day but um, you know. It's inevitable, though, wasn't it? It was going to happen eventually. The longer that NYCFC didn't have a stadium and continue to have a really good team, the more chance it had of, of happening. So, yeah. well, I mean, there is one thing that it's Brad Sims, the uh, the CEO, did get up on the mic outside City Hall and basically, well, not basically, he literally promised the new stadium. So, mm. I don't know whether he was, you know, he'd had a few too many champagnes and got a bit <laughs> excited, or if he was being genuinely serious there. But you know. It's, Seems like there's something the club really is battling for, and it seems like some of the uh, the government within New York really seem to be taking notice of them now and and making similar claims. So maybe this could be the thing that finally tips it over the edge and they, they get the stadium. 
Yeah, and hopefully so. I mean, that's, uh, you know, obviously they have put together a uh, very, very good squad, and uh, they are deserving of one. I would hope uh, maybe it's something like uh, something that you see in like Japan a lot, like a rooftop mm -hmm. uh, pitch. Yeah. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe you can't fit like uh, 30,000 people or something like that, but, you know, uh, some thousands. Uh, it's at least better than, uh, you know, what it's, uh, what it's at currently and what it uh, looks like, so... Uh, definitely, maybe something like that. Maybe get creative, yeah. guys. Let's uh, let's hope. But uh, but either way, that pretty much uh, is the episode. And uh, yeah, I want to thank Chris so much for coming on. And uh, guys, remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. And uh, but also, Chris, yeah, let us know where the good people can find you on the internet. Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter at CJSmith91 and on Instagram at Chris underscore Smith underscore MLS. So go and give me a follow and, and reach out. Indeed, yeah, he's a great follow. Always a plethora of amazing information. So uh, do that, please. But guys, yes, uh, that is the episode. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Oh!